Over the past six months, I've been designing and experimenting with several types of generators to find the build that works best for me to eventually graft into a gravity generator project. The final version of the generator will utilize weights connected to gears and possibly belts that will power the generator. Through the process of experimentation, it eventually occurred to me that I could use a stacking method to increase the amount of power output without having to create multiple types of generators. My initial idea was to harvest transformers out of broken microwave ovens and convert them to use as the coil system in the generator. It seems like everybody is throwing out broken microwaves until you're looking for one. I have managed to find and test one, however, that's given me an idea of what kind of power output I could get out of them. I can get close to 4 volts with a hand spin, which is roughly 200 RPM. I intend for the final version of my generator to work similar to the high output you might get out of wind power, roughly 500 RPM. So I could possibly squeeze 10 to 12 volts out of each coil at about 2 amps. I've seen some YouTubers build generators out of these converted transformers that use 2 to 10 coils. If you stacked them, you could place multiple rotors on the same shaft and place the converted transformers in a circle around each rotor depending on your power needs. One of the issues I've noticed in this type of generator is the drag created by the magnets on the rotor as they spin past the metal in each of the coils. You could remove the metal, but that would decrease the voltage and amperage you get out of your system. The metal is briefly magnetized as the magnet passes it, which sends a magnetic field all the way through the coil, and that's its purpose. You could cut down on the drag on this type of system by winding coils around metal screws with heat shrinks on them to protect the wire and offsetting two stators around the rotor. But that also means winding your own coils instead of harvesting them from microwaves, potentially winding a lot of them, which I decided against doing right now, as well as waiting until I find enough transformers to put a project together, or buying them separately for that matter, as that could be a bit pricey. I decided on a quicker and much more simplistic approach after watching one of Robert Murray Smith's videos. He's been using serpentine coils in some of his wind generator projects. Instead of individually wrapping multiple coils, you wrap one large coil and weave it in a zigzag pattern in a simple stator housing. If you haven't checked out Robert's channel, I highly recommend it. It's one of my favorite channels on YouTube. He's smart as a whip funny and has a positive attitude towards every project he works on. He also gives most of the 3D print files from his projects away for free, and he's as big a fan of Tinkercad as I am. Thinking and Tinkering is his main channel, but he has a couple of others that he created recently that have some great videos as well. I initially was going to use the same rotor I designed to go with the microwave transformers and integrate the serpentine coil into the design. I designed three different variations of it and spent a couple of weeks 3D printing the final stator assembly before I decided I wasn't happy with the design and scrapped the entire stator assembly, boxed it up and put it away. Partly because it was just too big, it was going to get costly before I really knew what kind of power output I was going to get out of it. So I decided to do something smaller that was scalable. That way if I was happy with the results, I could add on to it or even build a bigger and more powerful version later. And if I was unhappy with it, I wouldn't be out a lot of money. So I started over and designed a smaller, sleeker rotor that could be stacked together with multiple rotors around a series of coils. By placing the north end of a magnet on one side of the coil and a south end of a magnet on the other side, and then staggering them back and forth, it wouldn't be necessary to use metal with the coils, which would drastically cut down on the drag or cogging effect. This is part of the process, from printing to assembling the rotors. I added tiny holes in the slots for the magnets in the final design to make it easier to remove the magnets if necessary. I lined up the two original rotors incorrectly and had to remove the magnets from them and found it extremely difficult to do so. With the holes added, they can be popped out easily with a tack or a thin nail. Spacers keep each rotor at the exact same distance around each side of the stators. When Robert Murray Smith wound his serpentine coils, he wound a wire around the housing assembly in the stator and added 10%. That didn't work with the gauge I'm using, as I used a 23 gauge magnetic wire at 100 turns, whereas he used a 0.1 millimeter at 2000 turns. I wanted a bit more amperage in my system, which is why I chose the thicker wire gauge, 
and that meant I had to add closer to 30% to the length. I placed the spool of wire on a bearing, as well as a 4x4 that I used to wind the wire. I measured the exact circumference I would need and placed two round pegs on the 4x4 and left a few inches of excess on the end for the wires to be fed out of the stator and connected together later. The electrical tape is spaced evenly across the wire, not only to hold it together, but to make it extremely easy to bend into shape so that it fits right into the stator assembly with little adjustment. The first test I did with just one of the rotors was kicking out around 5 volts, so I figured it would be closer to 10 with the two rotors. Here it is with two rotors and two coils kicking out over 11 volts. Now this should be closer to 15 volts as the second coil is attached, but it's only getting half of the magnetic field that the first rotor is getting. And part of the issue here was also the spacing between the magnets and the coils. I also ran out of magnets in this size and didn't have enough to make a third rotor. So I ordered more magnets and redesigned the stator so that they could be moved closer to the magnets without wobbling around as the top of them had nothing holding them in place in the first design. This also meant that I had to redesign the outer housing of the assembly to add two more 8mm shafts and make the generator more sturdy and secure. With the new design I added a 5 pound weight as a flywheel and used a string to spin the mechanism which is similar to how the pull string works on a lawnmower. Now I was getting 26 volts from the stator much better. That's also at a higher RPM though. Hand spinning I've gauged at an average of 200 RPM, but by using the string to induce rotation it's over 400 RPM. That's closer to what I intend the final system to run at. I also tested the amps, which came out on average a little over one. Not bad for a basic system like this. A light hand spin can easily light up an LED. Though the ones I was using burn out if you go over 6 or 7 volts, so I burn out a handful of them by spinning the rotor too fast. Since I bought more magnets, I added more serpentine coils. I still had quite a bit of wire left, as I ordered 10 pounds worth. I also swapped the 5 pound weight for two 10 pound weights to use as flywheels, and added small capacitors to the bridge rectifier to smooth out the current. I'll detail that more shortly. As you can see though, even a light turn produces enough voltage to make a noticeable spark when you short the system. And the flywheels keep the generator turning and recharging the capacitor without adding more spin to the system. This was the process of adding more coils and more rotors. I eventually added five coils and five rotors, and then I ran out of magnets again. So I'll have to order more if I want to add more power to the generator and one of the coils only has magnets on one side of it, so it's generating half of the current that the other stators are. Diodes are really cheap, so I ordered three different types. The ones I used in the final version are 2 amp capacity, since I already determined that one coil can produce slightly more than an amp. The capacitors are 50 volt, 2000 microfarad capacity. I should also state that I'm not an electrician and have limited experience with wiring and electrical work but I've been expanding on that limited experience lately. So if you happen to be more electrically inclined, you might have made some different choices than I did. My intent was simply to wire everything together in the simplest way possible and share the information. Now I'd love to see others develop, improve, and expand upon what I've done and pass that information along, as I have. To rectify the current, from the generator so that you can do something more useful with it, you first need to build or buy a bridge rectifier. Bridge rectifiers are actually ridiculously easy to make, so I chose that route. If you're not familiar with them, diodes direct the current in one direction from the alternating current that the generator produces as a default. So to convert the alternating current to direct current, you simply twist tie two diodes together by their positive ends as you might twist a bread tie to seal a loaf of bread. Then twist tie two diodes together by their negative ends and then connect the two together. I also added capacitors to the negative and positive DC ends to smooth out the current a bit. I found that the generator runs smoother with less drag for me if I use it to power capacitors and then use the capacitors to feed power into the system. I ran 12 gauge electrical wire from each of the rectified leads 
of each of the generator coils and heat shrink them together. Heat shrink is easy to use and I had so little to do for this project that I didn't even bother to pick up anything to heat the wire covering. I simply used a candle. I then tested each coil separately to make sure it was working before I wired any of them into the system. You could use a bus bar to wire everything neatly, but I'm still in the testing phase of things, so I simply bolted the connectors together. For those who don't actively wire things on a regular basis, wiring the connectors from each coil in parallel increases the amperage, and wiring them in series increases the voltage. The charge controller I'm using in this phase of the project will work with an input voltage between 25 and 90 volts. So while I'm testing the system by hand spinning the generator, I have the coils connected in series. When I get to the phase where the generator is connected to a gear system later, I'll have the coils connected in parallel because it should produce over 120 volts in series, and that exceeds the capacity of the charge controller. So long as I stay under 50 amps, I can use this charge controller, which I should still be under in parallel unless I add more coils and magnets to the generator. To set the output voltage of the charge controller, I hand spun the generator and turned the screw until I reached 15 volts. Then I tested it by hand spinning the generator a couple more times to make sure the charge stopped at 15 volts. I picked 15 volts because I purchased a 16 volt capacitor pack and wanted to stay below its maximum capacity to avoid damaging it. Once I've adjusted things correctly, I can hook up an inverter directly to the capacitor bank and voila, you can plug standard electrical outlets into the system. I spun the generator by hand at roughly 200 RPM for about a minute and a half and charged the capacitor to 1 volt. So that should take less than a minute at a higher RPM. I'm going to wait until I have a gear system in place to give the generator a proper test for that though, because part of the output power goes into running the charge controller. So you need to maintain a steady consistent speed to keep it running and charge the capacitor smoothly. I tried charging the capacitor bank by hand for a few minutes and noticed that every time I slowed the rotational speed the power would start to drain out of the capacitor bank to power the charge controller. So hand spinning is fine for testing, but not a good method to see what the generator can really do when it's set up correctly. I didn't have the charge controller when I built my pedal generator a few months back, so I thought it might be interesting to hook it up and connect a cheap inverter I had laying around and see if I could light up a standard lamp. It worked but the load made the chains slip over the gears slightly. I'm guessing it might be better to charge some capacitors with the pedal generator and let those power the inverter, or possibly connect four of the six volt capacitor banks in series directly to the pedal generator and connect them to the charge controller. If there are any electricians watching this video, what are your thoughts? Regardless, this is where I'm currently at progress-wise with the stackable generator. When I have more money, I'll start building the frame for the gear system and adding more magnets and coils. I've thoroughly enjoyed the process of designing and building the generator though, and it's exciting to see it coming together from the design phase to a partly working model. Hope you enjoyed the update. Thanks for watching, and do great things.